So now to my and possibly also your amusement, I have totally nerded out in the first two videos and uh, I have very little hope that the last one is going to be any shorter than the first two. But whatever, here goes nothing. And uh, we will now look at the techniques of section B and uh, the potentially missing uh, information in this treatise. Um, but first of all, let me first uh, show you how I went about this. Um, I compiled a ridiculously long PDF where I had the transcription in there and then I broke down the situation in modern grappling terminology and uh, then I attempted to find these so-called analogous techniques in the various grappling sports and uh, I also made a footnote where I found the uh, most corresponding version in the books. Uh, now of course uh, at some point I realized that um, nobody was going to print this in this way. Maybe I will publish it uh, elsewhere at some other point. However, for this article I realized I had to break things down some more and uh, I compiled a number of tables and also made a number of diagrams for your convenience. So we have a number of techniques which are at least listed or mentioned in Baumann's Fechtbuch. And if we break these down according to their functions, uh, like what is the goal um, of the action mentioned, then we find, interestingly enough, that the highest number are attacks which the author does not explain how to do. So he attacks you in this manner which you are certainly familiar with and which you then are supposed to counter in a certain fashion. We also have a number of re-counters where the counter is counter or re-re-counters, uh, although the number decreases. Um, in and by itself, this uh, system reminds us a little bit of uh, the didactic structure that uh, Fiore employs, interestingly enough. The number of attacks which are explained is less than half of the number of counters which are explained. Uh, so that is interesting. You also have um, a number of holds and uh, come-alongs. And um, if we look here at the attacks, so the attack that the situation uh, which the author describes starts with, uh, in the vast majority of cases, it is a takedown attempt. We also have cases where um, he grabs you in a certain fashion. Uh, we have a very small number of cases where it is a joint lock, and we have a not all that small number where the opponent uh, comes at you and tries to punch. Now, again, I have tried to find um, analogous techniques for the ones in the treatise. And um, I have used uh, several systems of terminology. You can see here um, amateur wrestling. Then I also used judo. You can see the takedowns of rows here. Um, I'm not going to attempt to explain uh, these tables in detail here. Um, just so much, they are basically intended to help you find the quote unquote frog DNA. So, for example, if you are having trouble uh, understanding how the technique on uh, folio 16 verso is supposed to work, you could uh, uh, 
either go on YouTube and uh, find a video on how to do an old Chigari or read it up or you could also just go and ask the wrestling or judo coach of your choice and um, if you're polite enough he's likely going to be amused and maybe he will uh, put some effort into helping you. I should also mention that uh, all of my coaches were quite amused that I chose to write this and then again amusing my coaches is one of my uh, highest goals in life so therefore everybody was happy. Um, as you were able to see maybe in the table before there was usually a number of folios which corresponded to one uh, modern term for technique and um, you could argue that at least in some systems of terminology you could um, regard them as variations of one technique even though the treatise seems to treat them as different techniques so let us look at um, several variations of the Twirsch or um, as other uh, contemporary systems would call it uh, Schrenken. Basically the uh, two expressions mean the same thing, throwing somebody over a barrier um, to put it simply. Um, if we look at the ways that these techniques are done in the various modern grappling systems once again, we find a very similar style of execution in um, the older judo manuals. But we can also find techniques which are basically working with the same biomechanical principles in a number of other grappling sports. For example, here in Rankeln, it's called the Bodenschleuder, the outside uh, hook or outside block in this case is done with the knee and uh, the execution is uh, uh, falling to the side and turning over which is also something you will often find in wrestling as you can see here in this case the guy is um, putting in the outside hook and then he's sitting down while turning his chest to the ground and thereby throwing pinning the opponent um, in this case, he basically drops the knee into the outside of his opponent's knee to buckle him. And of course, as we have mentioned before, you can also turn this kind of situation into a suplex. Um, we also see this type of situation in our Swald, even though he calls it diff uh, differently, he calls it the uh, gewinnliche Tritt. Um, and here is some more variations which you may find in modern grappling sports. Um, I'm a big fan of Kinazzo. Uh, he has some um, variations which you rarely see in printed media and wrestling. Um, I am especially a big fan of this one. Um, and imagine if he's going to fall on top of the opponent, he's going to land with his forearm across the opponent's throat which we can argue is definitely an advantageous position. Um, we have a large variety of these things in Sambo. And um, we also have uh, uh, similar things in uh, Silat, for example, here, uh, sitting version, um, or this variation here, where instead of sweeping the knee, he basically kicks the knee through and uh, thereby wreaking havoc in the various ligaments and um, soft tissue in there. Uh, we have a number of techniques which uh, we would today classify as shoulder throws. Uh, here is also a variation with an interesting style of depiction in um, the Glasgow fencing book. Um, in this case, you could argue it, it looks more like a 
and that can do or do it laughing but um, that is another uh, there is a point to discuss elsewhere if we look at uh, modern grappling sports we can find a, a wide variety of these techniques including some which are quite quite similar uh, however i should point out that the execution which we can see in wallerstein here um, is um, quite a bit uh, uh, different from most of the things you will see today and the grip both hands on the forearms in some cases even the hands is uh, illegal in basically all modern grappling styles however apart from that we can find uh, uh, large number of similarities and uh, we can also see the possible variations of body position how to turn in where to put your hip how to throw the opponent down how to continue, how to pin him afterwards. Um, when we are talking about the quote-unquote illegal variations, um, I recommend that you have a look at uh, Chinna, which is a, according to who you read, you can could either call it style of its own, which is what Zauda Yuan suggests, uh, but it is also um, an overarching term for the grappling elements in the various Chinese styles. And in there you can find a lot of funny variations uh, on how to mess up your opponent's arms and shoulders while throwing him. Um, it's, uh, it really makes for a very interesting read. So we have uh, Durchlaufen um, or Kataguruma, uh, respectively fireman's carry. Uh, the depictions in Baumann's Fechbuch on the right here, section C and here, section B. Um, in the medieval, in the other medieval sources, uh, Talhofer might be the one uh, in the 15th century who has the largest variety of them. But you can also find them in Fiore, sometimes including very interesting variations, such as this depiction here in the Pisani Dossi, where he steps to the outside of his opponent's leg rather than in between the legs, which is the standard style of execution. I've tried this one and it makes for a really interesting variation if you can pull it through. Anyway, once again, if we look at uh, similar techniques in uh, modern grappling sports, we have the uh, standard execution in judo, which is very similar to this one or this one here. Um, then you have the kneeling version, as uh, Tanofa shows in this case, done from a collar grip. Um, you have a number of very funky but highly efficient variations in sambo. Um, some of which are quite wild, like here he starts with an arm spin and then he goes into a uh, fireman's carry. In wrestling, most of the variations you will find are kneeling, but there are some exceptions, such as this one in Greco, um, which is also finished differently. Once again, it's a suplex, and uh, quite often the attacker goes down on one and or both knees. Uh, while he's throwing. As we can see here, it doesn't really matter how you get the grip. You can also grip the opponent's chin and then in most cases, in my experience, he will go over willingly, although he might be a little bit mad at you afterwards because you ground his teeth together. We can see a uh, number of single leg variations uh, as we have mentioned before both inside and outside singles um, uh, arguably uh, what our smart here shows under the name of uh, i call it the sack five because he says he's going to uh, turn his opponent into one uh, sack five would mean back five in english and uh, 
what we can find here is for the most part fairly upright attacks uh, of an upright opponent uh, but we have some kneeling variations as we have seen and uh, you can find both types of attack in modern grappling sports i would argue that the kuchiki taoshi or what you can see in Sambo is actually, for the most part, fairly similar to, uh, for example, this attack here. <coughs> but um, uh, once again, you um, find all kinds of imaginable entries and finishes, for example, sweeping the opponent's thigh with your own thigh and dropping him backwards, or um, entering with a scissor step uh, into a low single, as we can see here. An interesting technique is the Sieben Zwirch. Um, as you can see here, the attacker grips the opponent's elbow and then he attacks the opponent's knee with his other hand. Uh, here we can see Dürer's interpretation, and uh, arguably in this case, Dürer is actually worse than the original offer because this hand position uh, plainly is not going to work. It will probably result in a sprained palm if done in this way. Um, so I don't know how much wrestling education Mr. Dürer had, but. Uh, with all respect to him as an artist, uh, I don't think he was more knowledgeable about wrestling compared to the original illustrator. Um, you can find this technique in a number of grappling styles worldwide. It's very, very popular in uh, Mongolian wrestling in Berk because it allows you to remain standing while uh, reliably dropping your opponent. Um, however, there's also kneeling variations which can be seen in Schwingen. Um, I have included the video sequence here. Um, or the, in my opinion, very good depictions in uh, Kinazzo also show the dynamic. And Kinazzo also shows that you can do this throw in two different ways. You can either attack straight on uh, as with an outside trip or a sotogari, just using the right arm to block the knee. Or you can turn in uh, as you would for a shoulder throw. In either case, um, the attack is at about a 45 degree angle to the opponent's line of stance, the line in between his feet. And... Uh, Therefore, these two angles of attack will work well, but uh, anything between them is likely not going to work uh, without problems. Here we have two interesting ones, uh, which are rarely seen in uh, medieval sources. Um, here we have the copy by Dürer, and here we have a similar situation in the Glasgow, although the arm is around the neck and here it's an underhook, it's arguably still the same technique. In the Glasgow we also find um, a name for this technique, it's called the Dritte uh, Fuß or the Third Foot. Um, now, if I remember correctly, Mr. Welle says that uh, this depiction is wrong and will not work and actually the description should match the picture that you can see here. Uh, personally, I have to respectfully disagree here. I think they both work. Um, although it is uh, very rare that you will find them in modern uh, wrestling books. The only one I have actually found in a wrestling book, it's not exactly the same, it's the one that Kinazzo depicts here. And in this case, it's the other way around. 
compared to the situation described here because in this case um, actually the attacker does the technique after being countered and in this case it is the counter but still um, even though there are differences um, also in the technical execution um, the wrestler here does not post his arm down uh, he just jumps back and flips the opponent over i would argue it's still the same principle at work here and uh, i would explain the differences in the executions in the execution once again with uh, the very low stance which you will encounter in wrestling but for this one i found an almost perfect match in a world war ii combatives manual uh, in kosnek <clears throat> Bernard Kosnick from 1944. Um, again, he does it in a different situation. He does it from uh, the opponent grabbing his belt and pushing him over. Um, but still, um, you can see here the position is basically the same, even though uh, this picture basically happens between these two positions. However, in Kosnick here, you can see how the throw can work biomechanically, the uh, attacker basically needs to make a 270 degree turn in front of his opponent and then throw him over the back slash hip. So um, uh, terminologically um, it's a little bit hard to place. Um, I found another German book uh, by Jean Foldiak, Foldiak um, which calls it an arm Fallschwung, um, but um, you could either refer to it as similar to a hip throw, to certain variations of hip throw, or you could uh, compare it to something like an arm spin, which works in the same way. This one is also quite interesting. Um, I at first had a little bit of trouble figuring out how it was supposed to work and how to um, what what term to use for it. At first, I thought it might be some type of outside hip throw, and then I saw this uh, this picture in uh, Paulus Karl, uh, where the hip is very far from the opponent, and so I started thinking about other possibilities, and then. Uh, I remembered that um, uh, I had actually learned a very similar technique and I found a variation which is extremely similar in my opinion. It's the execution by uh, multiple time world champion Saurbeck Sidakov here in red um, who does his trademark slide by down here. And it's basically the same situation. He gets a grip of his opponent's uh, uh, upper arm. Um, the source says biceps. Um, the way I learned it, it's actually the triceps. But if you can grip uh, some kind of jacket, you can grip wherever you want. And then he pulls the arm past while stepping in to a hip throw, sweeps the leg up while keeping a grip of his opponent's head. In this case, you uh, employ a reverse collar tie. In this case, it's a standard collar tie. But uh, either way, the result is the same. The opponent is brought down to the mat using his own momentum with uh, uh, not too much effort. Um, like I was once asked about uh, how much um, pull I thought I was putting into it and I said um, maybe 15 kilos on the head and 15 kilos on the arm which is not really a lot for somebody weighing 80 kilos so there is that um, and um, I think this is a very good example on how uh, knowledge of modern wrestling can uh, potentially help us to interpret certain situations which we might see in the treatises. Uh, if you have a different interpretation, feel free to let me know. I'm most interested, but 
most of all, I will ask you to bring me down with it. And uh, I think that is going to be the test that any uh, serious interpretation should go through. The section B is also interesting in another regard, and that is uh, it seems to place a large emphasis on tie ups. Tie ups is the wrestling term for grip on the opponent, especially a grip that is held for a longer time and used to gain a tactical advantage. And uh, as you can see here, a, vi a wide variety of tie-ups are used in the treatise, um, including some fairly unusual ones, I have to say. Um, for example, here we can see um, the various two-on-ones, which are in wrestling usually called inside and outside Russian. Um, and uh, the techniques that can arise from these situations. Um, we have the inside Russian here and here, and uh, we have an outside Russian here. Although uh, it is not a standard variation, it is here employed with both hands on the forearm, which again can result in an elbow lever and therefore it's something that you should not let the wrestling referee catch you doing. We can find again similar situations in uh, more modern wrestling books. Um, we find the uh, outside trip from the inside 2-1-1 here, um, also here. Um, here it is uh, similar to this situation here. Um, although in this case he uses a, a reverse collar tie to bring up the throw and here uh, he uses uh, an arm drag. Um, uh, once again you might be able to find some of the elbow manipulations rather in the context of Chinna or Silat where they don't give a damn about rules but they do love to break elbows. So, um, a fairly standard tie-up in modern grappling is the underhook. Um, it is here shown as a way to um, uh, execute a hip throw. Um, interestingly enough, what you can see most commonly is uh, what you might call a two-on-one underhook or a reinforced underhook. It's an underhook where the attacker here in red and here in yellow, um, grabs his own wrist to um, basically double up on the opponent's overhook, and something that our Svald also does to a certain degree. Um, here is a number of wrestling techniques where that is done in a similar way, of, although in this case I have to admit it's a little bit different because the opponent's head is also inside. I have uh, shown this technique to a couple of uh, people at the Trine, and um, I think they all agree that once the technique is locked in, it is a damn uncomfortable position. It's very hard to get out of. And that is also true for this type of underhook. Like if you lock it in, it is really tight. Of course, on the other hand, you can also do the same thing with an overhook. Um, so you could sum it up as whoever gets two hands on the opponent's uh, arm first uh, has a clue. Um, I have also done the same thing for the various uh, joint locks and what I call rips. Uh, the difference being that the joint lock is basically a submission meaning you are trying to force your opponent to give up, while a rip is uh, basically an attempt to uh, outright destroy the opponent's uh, joint. Um, now, in uh, judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you usually find submissions. 
um, also in catch wrestling. However, you do find rips quite a bit in amateur wrestlings. Um, they are taught as fouls and um, ripping through your uh, opponent's underhook, for example, is not too rarely seen and also fairly commonly taught in wrestling. Um, we can see here that the uh, um, joint of choice, so to speak, to attack with a lock uh, in this book is, uh, in most cases, uh, the elbow. Um, I think I forgot to include knee bars here. There is like two or three of those as well. But uh, either way, um, that is something um, that you would also observe in uh, most uh, schools of catch wrestling and also of uh, judo uh, up to this day. There's uh, fewer uh, attempts to lock the elbow and the fingers um, because uh, the, the shoulder and the fingers because those are arguably um, harder to uh, pull off. Um, you don't always have to break the elbow, you can just use it to manipulate, uh, for example, in Zucken, um, which we can see here. Um, you can bring your opponent into a, decent, a, a disadvantageous position. You can force him to give him your back and uh, you can move on to an arm lock from there. So basically it's this type of manipulation. Uh, it's a twisting movement. Uh, the hand is uh, forced or held down and the elbow is lifted up, forcing the opponent to turn. Uh, this is something uh, like a, the lock is something you can uh, find in judo. It's, it would be called a haragatame, or um, I think there is also a, um, other uh, slight variations where you pull it through the armpit, etc., etc. Um, the maybe most creative ones again you can find in China. Um, Mr. Da Yuan has like uh, 48 amusing ways to break people's elbows. And um, his colleague, Mr. Goshen, gives us this little jam here, where, as you can see here, the knee is actually used to uh, try and force the elbow through, uh, even though, as we can see in this sequence, uh, that can also be counted. And that is an important lesson to take away. While there are advantageous positions in grappling and in fighting, no, basically no position is so advantageous that is, it is uh, impossible to counter. Just in some cases, it's uh, very, very difficult, uh, especially if the opponent knows what he's doing. Um, more elbow manipulations, which can be locks, but don't necessarily have to be logs, uh, the arm ranking, which you could uh, compare to a modern arm drag. As you can see here, um, you can also see a number of uh, possible finishes, uh, sitting down, uh, taking the back, um, moving into a leg attack, taking the back, once again, moving into a suplex, as we can see here in a number of ways. Um, uh, once again, the variation from um, Chinna is quite interesting because the way he does the arm drag uh, is to the outside while the modern stars usually drag across in between the bodies. And uh, from this position, he can twist the arm and uh, move into what you would call a hammerlock in wrestling. Um, I think it's more colloquially known as a police grip. Um, unfortunately, I cannot show you right now. I um, will be happy to do that at the next event. <clears throat> then we also have variations of the double wrist lock, um, uh, both uh, with a figure four and without a figure four. And uh, these attacks are uh, basically in all cases used to throw the opponent uh, whether it's on the near side or it's on the far side. 
again, uh, Chinna to the rescue, you can find all kinds of uh, variations there, uh, including details, line drawings of the force vectors, etc. etc. So, if you ever have um, trouble with something like this, um, look up the, the books of Mr. Da Yuan and um, you shall receive. So, to sum things up a bit again, um, the results of the situations that are described in Baumann's Fechbuch in the wrestling section B are uh, in, I think, 46 cases a takedown. Um, then uh, a number of these takedowns happen via a joint lock. That is interesting. The joint lock uh, is often used to bring down the takedown. In some cases, it uh, seems to be a joint lock and rip without the attempt to uh, take the opponent down. In some cases, uh, the attacker gains position with advantage. In some cases, he breaks free. And um, there is a number of uh, other situations that result in punches, parries, kicks, knees, and holds or come alongs, which uh, these uh, latter ones can usually be um, categorized according to the terminology that you will find in MMA, which uh, again is taken from various sports, from uh, uh, wrestling to boxing, kickboxing, BJJ, etc. Having said that, what is missing? There is a number of things which are uh, notably not included in the treatise. Um, interestingly enough, uh, they include some things which other contemporary treatises have including ones which are a lot shorter than the wrestling section B. So, for example, the author does not really go into any detail what he thinks make, makes a good stance. If anything, you can read between the lines or pictures and uh, watch the wrestlers as they are shown and deduct what makes a good stance, while uh, other authors such as uh, Fiore, Talhofer, the Glasgow, um, Burms Ringbuch, uh, the Goliath, or Auerswald um, give you quite a bit of useful information on the subject. Um, in modern grappling styles, in the instructional books, usually you not only find advice on how to stand, but uh, sometimes some of which uh, can be quite amusing, as uh, this guy here. Um, but they also sometimes give you advice on quote unquote areas of attack, which is um, similar to what you can find in the commented version of the Auerswald. Um, or, for example, also Passion and Schmidt. So, uh, basically, it is um, the idea of the strength, the strong and the weak body parts. Um, the wrestling philosophy is a little bit um, uh, different than that. Uh, it is also phrased uh, a little bit more bluntly in most cases. For example, one of my coaches likes to say, hit him where he bends. So basically all joints can be attacked. While it does not make very much sense to attack the thigh if you have the choice, which would be the strong in um, the commented hours about the passion or Schmidt. Um, however, the armpit is totally free game. The armpit is actually one of the major um, points of attack, as is the area between the feet, at least in Greco, and um, also the head is an area of attack, but um, it's also a means of defense. Um, in wrestling you say that the head is the first line of defense, and um, your opponent has to get past your head in order to get to your feet, but um, that is a different 
Um, interestingly enough, uh, the treatise also seems to lack explanations on how to do the Haken. It even states um, then you can do all the techniques from the Haken as you have been instructed before. While other treatises, uh, especially the ones from around 1500 or after 1500, such as Wurm and Auerswald, um, lists a fairly large number of Haken techniques, as you can see here. Which, again, you can uh, also find in uh, more modern grappling books in case you ever struggle with the execution. Um, and, of course, uh, once again, if you love suplexes, uh, there is Haken variations for that as well. Um, I would also argue that the stance in which the wrestlers in Baumann's Fechtbuch are depicted, uh, which is a very wide stance uh, with uh, rather straight-ish legs, um, would be rather vulnerable against a Haken attack. And indeed, if we look at the uh, uh, books from around 1500 or uh, later, when the Haken really seems to have come into fashion, um, most of the wrestlers uh, have adopted a narrower stance, which is something you can also see in uh, various wrestling schools today. Uh, for example, the uh, Caucasian ones like uh, Dagestan, Chechnya, Georgia, etc., where there is a lot of very capable Haken specialists. And finally, um, the treatise also does not give us any training advice, unlike, for example, Talhofer, which tells you to throw stones and uh, push uh, bars and dance and jump and fence and ring and um, do various things on horseback. And uh, here is my uh, Polish colleague, Mr. Talaga. Uh, showing us his interpretation of what it might mean to uh, Stangen schieben. And uh, we have also uh, several uh, styles of uh, folk gymnastics, most of which have survived in Switzerland, where you have uh, various ways on how to throw stone uh, for distance. Um, the thing that, uh, that is uh, often employed in modern grappling is what is called body weight training. It's basically using your partner as a means of resistance for various exercises. Um, most of my coaches were big fans of this um, because they say it's a wrestler's job to manipulate an opponent's body. And uh, if you train mostly by body weight training, you can gain a better understanding of how to do that compared to just simply, and in their words, stupidly lift weights in the gym. Uh, of course, uh, it does not necessarily have to be a human partner. You can uh, lift various types of animals and uh, you are probably familiar with the story of a famous Greek wrestler, Mylon of Croton who uh, gained his strength by lifting a bull. Um, you can find similar stories uh, in India and uh, all over the place, basically. Uh, wrestlers very often come from uh, rural communities and um, therefore they get creative with what they have at their disposal. Um, Gymnastics and tumbling are also very important for wrestling. Um, it uh, can really pay off to take some tumbling classes or even better start tumbling when you're a kid. If not, you can use some kind of progressive system starting once again with the simplest uh, tumbling exercises and then working up to um, uh, our box, etc. Another training uh, implement that I would like to mention is uh, rubber bands. Um, 
in the Eastern Bloc uh, wrestling systems, they are considered to be the main training aid apart from the partner. And um, it's usually long bands, like three to five meters, um, offering a lot of stretch and allowing you to do various drills and exercises simulating certain techniques and positions. If uh, you're interested in that, I have also totally nerded out on that subject at some point. Just uh, send me an email or something and I'm most happy to um, nerd out about it again. So, finally, after what was it more than two hours um, of videos let us come to some conclusions um, if we compare the tactical advice the techniques and didactics to modern grappling sports you can say that the tactical advice part b is still up to date and most things will still be repeated by modern uh, wrestling coaches at least the good ones the technique selection makes sense in the given context. Um, once again, I should point out part C, focus armed fighting, and part B, focus unarmed fighting. Um, if the trainee already knows the basics, um, that is especially true for uh, section b as i have pointed out but also for section c of course without text and anything um, especially the technique selection in section b would be broad enough to produce a variety of versatile wrestlers which will each have their own um, selection of technique and their own style and they could still do that operating out of the system uh, the same, in my opinion, would also be true for section C, if you consider the techniques uh, in, which are shown just in armor. Um, the white stance can be a possible weakness of this system, making it vulnerable to the Haken or Grapevine. Um, another thing is that um, I think the double... Uh, the inside 2 on one as shown, would not be ideal. It would be an invitation to take the opponents back. But um, if you go back to that slide, you will also see that uh, Jacques Muradov himself shows one version um, of the inside 2 on one in a certain position which is uh, fairly similar to the one in uh, Bauman's Facebook, so maybe we should not be too harsh to judge. And uh, finally, the didactic sequence is one possible approach, which is still used today, as you can see in um, uh, this book here. When it comes to the so-called frog DNA, I think I was able to demonstrate there is usually several analogous techniques um, in various modern combat disciplines. It's more a question of which is the most suitable for uh, what is shown in the treatise. And being aware of these similarities might be able to, uh, might be helpful when you are thinking about cross training, like which. Um, modern combat sport to train in and or uh, research when you are looking for um, input to help you with your interpretations. Um, as I said initially, um, it's not all that easy to distinguish a technique and a technique creation. Various systems have different approaches and uh, sometimes these approaches are also founded in the didactic system of that uh, style or school. The lines are often blurry between techniques and variations, uh, depending on who you ask. Um, the um, terminology for the various technique can, techniques can vary from region to region, from school to school, and of course from style to style. 
So um, if you're talking to a person from another style or school, you at least need to point out a reference where they can see what you mean or in most cases uh, the best thing just is to pick them up and throw them and um, they will uh, know well enough what you mean if they uh, have sufficient grappling knowledge. And interestingly enough this phenomenon was already described in the Polhaus book um, which is uh, uh, famously used to date Mr. Lichtenauer's work prior to 1386, uh, which again is something that uh, newer research tends to dispute quite a bit, but uh, that's another story. Whatever the quote goes, uh, also know that uh, you can not really well and meaningfully talk about fencing or write about it and inter interpret it, but uh, you may well show uh, and instruct with the hand. And that is still something that uh, most wrestling coaches today will agree with, probably all of them. Uh, I had, uh, like one of my coaches always said, first you have to feel it and then you can understand. And of course, when he said feel, usually he meant you have to be in pain and uh, you have to learn through the pain. Finally, what makes a good wrestling book? Um, that is a topic that uh, Mr. Belle has done a lot of interesting research on. He says that uh, the most, the biggest task of a wrestling book is to create an internal picture of motion in you. And I agree, but um, that also means that uh, what works for you will largely depend on your grappling experience, on the hours you spent on the mat, on the system, on the school, and um, what you learned and how you learned it. And that means that advanced practitioners with the right background may just get as much um, information, as much input out of part C of Bauman's Fechbook as they do of the uh, much more extensive part B. Personally, <laughs> I have to admit that that was something that uh, happened to me during my research. I uh, started out mostly knowing the part B and then as I had a closer look at part C um, I uh, found myself actually more interested in that because it had some variations which were um, to me more unusual than the ones of part B which I was basically all familiar with with the exception of a small handful and uh, so I think uh, that was an interesting development and for that reason I think uh, the next book I will uh, give more attention to will probably be the various editions of the Bloomer's Campus. So I think we are nearing the close to three hour mark therefore uh, I would like to thank the very few that have made it through all three of these videos. Um, as always, I don't know everything, far from it. Uh, even my coaches, as much as it pains me to admit it, don't know everything. Uh, I'm always happy to discuss any, um, any part of uh, what I said and uh, I'm also more than happy to um, uh, give you a demonstration on the mat and or uh, watch your interpretations play out or not. Thank you very much and uh, have a good time. I will see you on the mat.